heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Live from New York and San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. And tech, it outperforms as stocks jump on the jumbo Fed rate cut. We talk mega caps on the move. Plus, Apple gets an EU warning to open up its iPhone operating system. And Elon Musk's X is back on in Brazil. How the platform bypassed a ban through a software update. But first, let's check in on these markets because risk assets we're up and to the right. We have finally found that bid post the Fed rate cut of some 50 basis points. And we roar higher the best day in at least a month for the Nasdaq 100, up almost 2.5%. And crypto, too, getting its mojo on. We're at 4.5% if you're looking at Bitcoin. And, Ed, you're going to look at the mega caps. Yeah, I mean, the biggest percentage and points gainers on the Nasdaq 100 are the mega caps. And a lot of investors have come on this show and said when it comes to tech, there will be a recalculation around valuation. But actually, a lot of the conversation this morning is we're going to avoid a recession. And that always comes up in the context of mega caps. They're a very diverse group, particularly Tesla, right? How much has Elon Musk talked about the impact of higher rates on EV sales? Not that Elon Musk and Tesla are going to be focused on the business of selling cars for much longer, Caro. Well, that's the one thing that we've got to be keeping an eye on when it comes to Tesla, when it comes to cars, robo taxis, the future. But for the here and the now, should mega caps be roaring? Let's talk to Zachary Hill, head of portfolio management at Horizon Investments. $8 billion in assets under management. We're going to discuss first and foremost the rate cut. What does it mean for these names that we've been so used to leading the market higher? Sure, Caroline, thanks for having me. You know, it's been quite the 24 hours. Um, you know, after that, that supersized rate cut, which most people in the market, us included, expected to be 50 basis points, although economists were, were skewed more towards the 25 camp, um, you know, we saw some mixed price action. And overnight, it looked like we were going to get a viable dip. Um, and coming in, coming in this morning, uh, things look quite a bit different. And so we do think that overall the trend is higher, um, kind of look through some of this short-term noise. And as it relates to the top of the market, we do believe now for the first time in about 18 months that the market can really broaden out uh, in a meaningful way. And so they're you know, not giving up on the AI theme and the mega caps in general. They're outstanding companies. But I do think we have a little bit of a window for the rest of the market to catch up here. OK, when you say broaden out, you mean small caps more broadly? Or is there a way to broaden out the technology investment theme? Yeah, we like doing it across both vectors, actually. Um, you know, in terms of the expression of the AI trade, kind of moving away from the semiconductors, because if you just look at the kind of the chart patterns there and just the overall narrative, it seems a little bit exhausted relative, you know, to some other some of the other players in the growth space. Also, I do think, um, as you mentioned, small caps, you know, they have a window here where they can work. Uh, regional banks is another part of the market that we like. Um, that's probably going to be more of a trade for us. Um, but we do think, you know, the fact that rates are coming down, growth is still strong, and the next move by the Fed is going to be a cut. We can quibble about that's 25 or 50 when that, when that occurs. But at the end of the day, we don't really think that matters as much for the broader picture. So those are two different areas we're playing that broaden out theme within U.S. equity exposure. So, Zachary, with that in mind, why is it the semiconductor names and mega caps that are rallying hard this morning? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, and I don't have a, a, a really spot on answer for you now. I mean, I would just say broadly speaking, over the last three weeks, we've seen a lot of volatility in these names. Um, you know, speaking for the, the kind of the most popular stock in the world, NVIDIA, um, you know, we saw earnings. They were really good, but not as good as uh, people have come to expect. We got kind of a delayed reaction on that on that stock the following week um, and then reversed the following week. So there's just been a lot of back and forth, broadly speaking. And that's another reason that we think broadening out makes sense, just because the volatility of this trade has gotten higher. Um, it's gotten more difficult to hold. And so from a risk adjusted perspective, you know, we think it makes sense to look outside of just the tip of the spear that's really you know, been driving us for the last 18 months. Your second point earlier was that rates are going to come down and we can debate the increments going forward and look at the dots through the end of next year. But a quite reasonable question for many technology investors is what had actually changed between July and yesterday? right? A 50 basis point cut yesterday and nothing through the summer. Uh, and that, for you guys in the markets, must be difficult to calculate. 
Yeah, it is difficult. And you have to play a little bit of criminology with what's going on, you know, within the FOMC. I mean, you know, our, our read of it is, I think, Chair Powell, who's more dovish than the committee more broadly, he wanted to cut rates in July, but couldn't get anyone there. Um, and so, you know, the actions that we saw um, in the blackout period to kind of move the market towards a 50 basis point cut, um, that that was in, indicative of Chair Powell kind of trying to make up for, um, you know, what didn't happen in, in July. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons that stocks didn't rally initially yesterday after uh, everything was released in the afternoon is that it's pretty clear the committee is more split than we thought. Um, and so, you know, the, almost half the committee wrote down only one further cut, um, you know, this year which is quite a bit different than where the market is priced. And so, you know, I, I do think there'll be some back and forth on that. But broadly speaking, you know, the message is if the labor market continues to slow down into an area where we start to get concerned, the Fed will be more aggressive. Yeah. And the fact that we have that Fed put back um, in in scope, uh, something we haven't had for about two and a half, three years, I think that's a really important thing that you can lose sight of if you're, you know, just in the day to day trying to explain um, hour by hour moves. Zachary, this isn't just the central bank to the US, it's the central bank to the world, and we're seeing risk assets rally across the world. What about European tech? ASML, the best performer from a points perspective in Europe today. What about Japanese tech? Yeah, I mean, we do continue to think the story is better in the U.S. Um, than abroad. You know, that a lot of that just has to do with the innate uh, innovation and, and the structure of our capital markets versus the rest of the world. But we do think there's some opportunity in Japan. Um, you know, that's more of a medium term story in terms of structural reforms in a really, really cheap currency that can be a tailwind to, to U.S. investors. We're starting to see the yen correct, um, you know, quite a bit over the last uh, over the last few months. And we think that is a favorable trend that will continue there. Um, but broadly speaking, we do we do like to express this theme more within the U.S. Um, you know, talking about the European angle more more broadly, I do think it's a little bit wild that um, there's only about a 25 percent chance that the ECB cuts rates in October. You know, if you look at the growth trajectory, you look at the inflation dynamics. Um, I really think they've been just waiting for some air cover from the Fed. And so I, I, I think that's something that the market may start to think about, you know, over the next few weeks. And, um, you know, from a currency perspective, certainly that wouldn't be, um, you know, beneficial for, for European uh, equities. Zachary, let's conclude our conversation with an important question for technology investors and the technology industry around the world. Recession or no recession? Yeah, this this one's pretty clear. No recession. Um, you know, our framework has long been um, do not bet against a U.S. consumer that is employed. Um, so we've been focused, laser focused on the labor market. And our read there is we're just coming back to normal from a period of extreme strength. Um, certainly, we're paying attention to the, the data flow as they come in and, and marking that to market, um, you know, every day. But, you know, broadly speaking, um, that has been our view and continues to be our view. And, and we think that plus the fact that the next move um, from the Fed and other global central banks are going to be cuts um, is going to bias equities higher into the end of the year. Zachary Hill from Horizon Investments. Great to have you here on Bloomberg Technology. Thank you very much. So coming up on the show, we'll be joined by the Latvia president, Edgar Zrinkovic, about his visit to San Francisco, Silicon Valley meetings with technology companies. Now, in the markets, Carrie, there are some single name moves that we've got to cover. We do, and Intel and Mobileye are among them, Ed. Intel up almost 3%. Mobileye, as you'll see, jumping some 15%. This is as it seems Intel will not be currently planning to divest a majority interest in the maker of software and hardware tech for autos. They believe in the future of autonomous driving technology. This is Bloomberg Technology. Apple. It's been warned by the European Union to open up its highly guarded iPhone and iPad operating systems to rival technologies or eventually risk some significant fines under its flagship digital antitrust rules. Bloomberg's Gian Volpicelli joins us now. And Gian, how serious is this warning? How likely are fines? Hi, Caroline. Uh, I mean, this is not an investigation yet. It's something uh, called specification proceedings, meaning that it is a step 
shy of an actual investigation. Uh, in a statement, the Commissioner for Competition, Margaret Vestaya, said that the intent is guiding Apple uh, on the way to interoperability. So there is still some time uh, for Apple to address these concerns. For sure, if nothing changes over the next six months, there might be steps, there might be consequences. But right now, uh, it's not as serious as it could be yet. Jan, there's some misunderstanding about the technology side of this story. For example, in Europe, Apple has held back some of its latest features due to compliance, what it sees as a compliance issue with the DMA. But the idea is not that you take a Samsung phone or a Xiaomi phone and you suddenly have iOS on it. Just explain the basics of what they want Apple to do. But what I understand, it is a couple of things. It is essentially allowing developers to access uh, features of iOS that uh, right now work only with uh, Apple software. Think, for instance, of Siri. Uh, Siri is, of course, something that only works within the Apple ecosystem. Technically, you could imagine a developer wanting to access some features of Siri for its own app uh, on, of course, the iOS ecosystem. Or uh, payment features. Some payment features only work uh, within uh, Apple uh, apps, Apple software. And that's another thing. Uh, one thing that also the commission addresses is uh, interoperability of devices. Again, some features, for instance, of Siri only are accessible to, for in, uh, instance, okay. devices such as the AirPods or other Apple uh, types of gear. And so we want, I mean, the U European Union would want ideally that to change and be accessible to other devices. Bloomberg's Gian Volpicelli out of Brussels. Thank you very much. Now, we have a visitor from the European Union, Edgar Zrinkovic, the president of Latvia, is in San Francisco. He's meeting with tech companies like OpenAI, Meta and Google. He'll also meet with California Governor Gavin Newsom and investment firm Apollo. President Zrinkovic joins me here in San Francisco. Good morning, Good Mr. Morning. President, and thank you for being here. You heard from our colleague in Brussels the latest piece of EU oversight of a large American technology company. There's also sort of a personnel consideration. Henna Verkinen will become an important leader in Europe when it comes to tech. What is Latvia's attitude uh, to, to the policy side, but also the new people at the top? Well, actually, we have heard the proposal from the president of the European Commission about the new commissioners. Uh, I do believe that this is quite a balanced proposal, but let's not forget that European Parliament still needs to approve each and every commissioner. There is going to be a grilling. But uh, I do hope that the new commission is going to be uh, very much focused on competitiveness of the European Union. I think defense and security is going to play a huge role also yes. when it comes to the new budget. And then indeed we have new issues. You already mentioned about a couple of my meetings. Also we have those. Well, those meetings, Mr. President, uh, met to open AI. Those are today. I'm just starting from, uh, from this morning. A meeting with all those uh, What's companies. your ambition for those meetings, Mr. President? Uh, there are actually two big issues. One, uh, Latvia is striving to become one of the, I would say, pioneers and leaders of uh, artificial intelligence in the European Union. We are now creating our National Artificial Intelligence Center, that is a uh, private-public partnership. Actually, the idea started from security concerns, but now we have expanded it uh, not only to include security, like deep fakes, like interference in elections, but also uh, in order to, to create a competitive uh, environment and uh, to take, uh, let's say, lead in this manner. And uh, one thing that I'm going to discuss and uh, look at is uh, the way how we can cooperate. We already have very good cooperation with Google, with Meta, uh, and we very much hope to expand it. So that's one. Second, uh, indeed, I do believe that it is very important that we discuss how we are going to address uh, artificial intelligence, social media, you know, all those discussions, uh, whether we should view them as challenges or opportunities. I'm still trying to find a way how to find the middle ground and being the part of the European Union, of course, to influence also the discussion. President, is 
more regulation necessary when it comes to AI and social media? Well, this is a very tough question. Uh, I do believe that if we look at um, uh, some challenges we have seen, the use of uh, social media, artificial intelligence for disinformation, uh, deep fakes, interference in elections, I think we need some framework. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and this is sometimes a challenge for the European Union and about the European Union, let's face it, we sometimes back in Europe get overly regulatory. Uh, sometimes we believe that here in the United States uh, there is too much liberal approach. So from that point of view, I would say that the balanced view, uh, some regulation, especially when it comes um, to serious issues, the crime, uh, political interference, yes, we do need uh, rules, but uh, let's not uh, overreact also here. Let's talk about serious issues at the moment that the EU and your country in particular faces when it comes to Russia an armed Russia, and we understand a drone recently crashed in Latvia. How should NATO respond to this sort of technology, to drones? Should they shoot them down? What, what is your view? Well, uh, actually, uh, this is a really very good question because also as part of my visit, I've been in uh, NASA. We were talking uh, about the cooperation in aeronautics, uh, in drone industry. My country also leads drone coalition uh, that is supportive of Ukraine. Uh, but when we talk about defense, I do believe that uh, we currently lack common approach in NATO. We have now already three countries, my country, Latvia, Romania, Poland, where we have seen drones crashed. Uh, investigation is still ongoing, but there is a great reason to suspect that uh, that Shahid type drone uh, was actually blowing uh, flying from, uh, from uh, Ukraine, passing Belarus and simply crashed. My belief is, yes, we need to shoot down those drones. We need to give more uh, air defense equipment to Ukraine. But also, uh, back in NATO, we are talking about the need to increase also NATO presence when it comes to air defense in so-called eastern flanks. So, yes, NATO must adapt to the new reality and we must shoot down drones, we must protect uh, the territory of the alliance. Mr. President, Latvia has, um, has a role here because of its location, its geographic proximity to what's happening. A big question asked of leaders across the European Union is what to do next and whether from a uh, technology and, and weapon standpoint uh, there is an argument to approve the use of sort of longer range technology to go into Russia in support of Ukraine doing such an action. What is your policy uh, on that? Well, I think it would be very surprising if I would be saying that we have to be cautious. No. Uh, the long-standing view of Latvian government, my personal view, is that when uh, it comes to Ukraine, when it comes to support for Ukraine, we must allow using all weapons, all weapon systems that we provide to Ukraine unconditionally. I don't believe in that talk about escalation. Yes, we hear uh, noise from Moscow, but if you look back at uh, the beginning of the invasion in February 2022, we have heard that kind of uh, messages from Moscow and actually what is happening uh, when uh, Russia escalates, Ukraine is not able to respond. Uh, but when uh, Ukraine gets weapons and is able to respond, actually Russia is not escalating, it actually de-escalates. So uh, my own firm belief is that we must change the narrative from uh, we must help Ukraine till uh, or whatever it takes or how long it takes to we must help Ukraine till it's full. So no diplomatic victory. breakthrough to the deadlock? We've got much of that being discussed in a presidential election race here in the United States. Uh, I think that there is already some political process. We had peace summit in Switzerland in June. President Zelensky is talking about another peace summit, maybe somewhere in November, maybe after U.S. elections. But I do believe that uh, diplomatic breakthrough or political process 
can start only when Russia sees that it cannot move forward, that we are supporting Ukraine and that it needs to sit at the table. It's not uh, for Ukrainians currently to call the first shot. It's actually for Russia. But I also think that it's not going to be any political process until U.S. elections. Most probably we can talk about some kind of political process or some kind of diplomatic efforts next year. But here I think that uh, we also should not make mistake. If we start, uh, let's say, putting some kind of limitations on Ukraine, then we are not going to see Russia willing to sit at the table, just, uh, just the opposite. Mr. President, we have less than a minute. You'll, you'll meet with Apollo, you'll meet with OpenAI. I'm curious if you want to attract investment infrastructure like data center, talent in your country? Absolutely. That's one of the things that we are going to talk uh, about uh, attracting investment. Yesterday I had an event uh, where some of our startups were pitching okay. for investment. Uh, I think they were doing great. There was quite an interest. And yes, I will be doing my best bet also to attract uh, talents, investment, to get partnership with uh, OpenAI and other companies. We wish you well with those meetings. We thank you for thank your time you. today. President of Latvia, Edgars Rinkovic. So much more ahead. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg Technology. time for Talking Tech. And first up, OpenAI has hired former Coursera executive Leah Belsky as its first general manager of education, leading the AI startup's efforts in bringing its products to schools and classrooms. Belsky was formerly chief revenue officer of Coursera. Plus, Microsoft President Brad Smith issues a warning of U.S. election meddling, telling the Senate Intelligence Committee that foreign interference will likely surge in the final 48 hours before the election. The hearing comes after a Microsoft report found Russian efforts to influence the election. And Germany's EV market plunges, with deliveries falling 69% in August. Car makers now calling on the European Commission for urgent relief and revisions to its fleet emission targets that could have Europe's auto industry facing hefty fines. Carrot. So much more coming up, Ed. Amazon unveiling a new AI tool to help online merchants. All those details next. Plus, why Elon Musk's X is now being fined nearly $1 million per day by Brazil. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Let's get a check on these markets, Ed, because we are powering higher on the back of that Fed rate cut. We're now having a very strong day, best since a month, really, for the Nasdaq 100. But so, too, are global stocks feeling the risk on vibes. And we're looking at the European tech industry doing very well. They're closing up their trading on the day. We're up 3.4% for that part of the stock 600. Move on, look at the individual movers. Because, look, we've got... The mega caps that we've known and loved and have done so well, even in a rate higher environment, still doing well as rates get cut. We're up 5% for NVIDIA. We're Alibaba, seeing Chinese names really rally too, and we're higher since May 2024 for this particular name. And I leave you with PayPal, because there's some individual news around as well. PayPal, well, that button is going to be there if you're buying with Prime. So they're sealing a deal with Amazon. Mizuho really shining a light that they are so important to the broader payment ecosystem. What have you got, Ed? Let's head out to Latin America. Elon Musk's ex has found a workaround to bypass its suspension in Brazil and paying the price. X was suddenly back online after a software update used Cloudflare IP addresses to gain access. Brazil's top court banned X last month after it refused to abide by certain standards. Now the same court is implementing a 920,000 daily fine for skirting the band. Bloomberg's Andrew Rosati joins us from Rio de Janeiro. OK, let's start with the workaround. How does it work? of internet providers. Um, X changed the way it routes its traffic on the site. And it's now using uh, IP addresses that are shared with really popular Brazilian websites like bands and, and even government 
uh, banks and even government websites. So it's very hard for regulators to clamp down now because if they do, that would imply that lots of other popular websites uh, would also be inadvertently blocked. So um, it's really put many regulators in a difficult position here. X has responded, a spokesperson saying it was an inadvertent and temporary service restoration to Brazilian users and we expect the platform to be inaccessible again in Brazil soon. But this is hefty fines being laid down. Is this usually the response from the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court uh, has specifically uh, one Supreme Court judge, Alexander de Moraes, has been locked in a months long feud with Exxon's owner, Elon Musk. Um, the Supreme Court judge. Uh, it is heading this campaign here, which he says is needed to clean up the Internet and really you know, take down a lot of vitriol, hate speech uh, that has been really, really spreading over the last few years in Brazil. You know, Musk, uh, for his part, um, has often referred to himself as a free speech absolutist. So this, these are kind of like two trains clashing with one each other. And this is just the latest twist in this longstanding feud. Uh, the Supreme Court has applied fines and uh, on Musk companies already um, for over content um, moderation. And we're, we're seeing an increasingly harsher tone um, and more threats to, to apply additional fines like we're seeing today. Andy, you're in Rio. Uh, how, how is this story being discussed in the local press? What do social media users of Brazil make of all of it? So yesterday or in late Tuesday or early Tuesday morning, when these reports that X was coming back, you know, this really stunned a lot of Internet users in Brazil because uh, the ban has been really widespread. And um, uh, for most average users, we just simply not have access to the site anymore. So people were really shocked, and there was all this spe speculation that you know maybe the ban had been revoked, uh, maybe maybe Elon Musk had uh, kind of uh, started to obey the court orders, and that or perhaps the yeah. ban had been revoked. So uh, this is you know a lot of people were excited when it was back, but now you know we're kind of seeing that we're not we may not be any closer to seeing it come back in here in Brazil. We might be back with you soon, Andrew Rosati. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Amazon has announced it's launching a new AI assistant to help online merchants. It's codenamed Project Amelia. For more, Bloomberg's Matt Day joins us. Another day, another female name for an AI, generative AI chatbot. What is this one going to do, Matt? So this one is aimed at Amazon sellers. That's the you know, millions of people, you know, small businesses in the US and Europe, a lot of manufacturers and uh, direct-to-consumer outfits out of China. Um, that sell on Amazon's site, right? These folks account for most of the sales uh, Amazon makes around the world. And now there's a tool that, you know, if a seller has a question about their inventory or what might sell well for the holidays, they can just, you know, use the chatbot uh, interface we're all so familiar with by now after ChatGPT. Matt, we, we kind of take for granted how Amazon.com works, right? If you're a consumer, you're used to using the Prime app and you might not ever think about the merchant or the seller. How does Amazon kind of invest in them, try to keep them on side? My understanding is like if you're approaching a busy holiday season, you ask the tool that we're showing on the screen, like, tell me how to prepare for this. How do I run my business? Yeah, so behind the scenes, Amazon is in sort of a fever competition for sellers. I mean, we all remember the rise during the pandemic of Shopify and sort of direct to consumer sites, brands selling on their own. You know, obviously eBay is still out there. Walmart is courting uh, independent merchants that sell on its site. So is Target. So there's, there's really a race right now to lock down folks who just want online shelf space, for lack of a better word. And so Amazon, you know, has clearly felt in the last few years, despite their lead as the largest online marketplace, that they have to keep investing in tools for those sellers or else they might go elsewhere, right? If they're seeing returns on Shopify or returns on Walmart, you know, maybe they uh, put a little bit less effort into Amazon. Matt Day, for the latest, we thank you. Meanwhile, coming up, we're going to be hearing from Gary Gensler and the potential risks he sees arising from the use of AI, but that's in finance. Meanwhile, talking of other areas of finance, risk on in the world of crypto right now. Bitcoin currently up almost 5%. We're eclipsing 63,000, having a strong day post those Fed rate cuts. This is Bloomberg Technology.
Too many brokers and money managers use the same AI for work. It could set the stage for market turmoil. That's according to SEC chair Gary Gensler, who spoke to Bloomberg's Remain Bostick and Alex Steele yesterday. Have a listen to this. We've been automating for a long time. I mean, I'm told that well over 100 years ago, there were debates on whether to let telephones on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So automation is a good thing overall, but it, it, you're absolutely right. We have to also make sure that we still protect the investing public. In terms of artificial intelligence, uh, I think it can bring greater access and promote markets, but at the same time, we have to guard against fraud, and fraud is fraud, and whether you're using an algorithm to defraud the market or your uh, human is doing it, it's against the rules. I do think that there's a challenge that the, the financial crisis of the future might be that we, we say, oh my gosh, we were all relying on the same model, the same algorithm, the same data. That's a challenge that is on this guy's mind, is how we ensure there's still a diversity of views, uh, sort of amongst it, that, that the algorithms compete with each other rather than all relying on one, you know, uh, you know, if you ever saw that movie 2004 and everything, one HAL or one big uh, computer like Scarlett Johansson was that uh, uh, romantic interest uh, in her. And then when she went offline, all 8,316 of her romantic partners were heartbroken. I, I don't want that to happen in the financial sector. Weaving romance into the world of regulation, SEC Chair Gary Gensler there. Speaking of AI and finance, fintech startup Intelligent Alpha is launching as a new investment firm designed to capitalize on, you guessed it, artificial intelligence. Yesterday, we mentioned that it is offering a chatbot-powered ETF, promising to harness the brain power of the likes of Warren Buffett, Stanley Druckenmiller, David Tepper, and more. Pleased to welcome Doug Clinton, founder and CEO of Intelligent Alpha. So, you have an investment committee of chatbots, Claude, Chachi, PT and the like. What inputs have you been giving them? What have you been getting out to design this ETF? Well, we give them inputs to help them understand how humans actually think about investing. And I can speak directly to what we just heard Chairman Gensler say. I mean, Carolyn, this is a question that we get from investors, actually. Won't AI just all do the same thing? And our research, our studying of this over the past year is that the answer is no, they don't. Because our technology really depends on the inputs and the philosophy that you try to give the AI to act on its investments with. So you can make it think like a Warren Buffett and be very value conscious, or you can make it think like an aggressive growth investor. No matter what you want to do, AI can be adaptable. And I think that's why we're not going to see AI sort of do all the same thing. It's going to be very different like human investors are. So I'm assuming you've been testing this all in beta before you offer the ETF to the world. This investment committee, I'm sure you will come clean with, didn't get the Fed cut right. It thought it would be a 25 basis point cut. Don't get me wrong, a lot of people got it wrong. But what have they been getting right? What output have you seen in terms of their stock picking that's been interesting? AI is fallible. It did get the rate cut wrong. It did predict that we'll get a skip in November, which I still think is interesting. I mean, a 50 basis point cut, maybe the Fed was actually kind of thinking there's a chance where we just want to be aggressive and see how things go, and maybe they will skip to AI's prediction. But in terms of what we're seeing from AI right now in our first fund that we just launched yesterday, the Intelligent Livermore ETF, the ticker is LIVR, AI is focused on a few different areas. So AI is actually one area it likes, it likes itself. It's also focused on Asia, Latin America, and defensive stocks. And so what we've created, or what our committee has created really, is a portfolio that's sort of balanced between offense and defense, offense with those AI names, and then defense with things like healthcare and consumer staples. Hello, Doug. Familiar face to the show, new name. Um, what does Warren Buffett, Stanley Druckenmiller, and David Tepper think about this? Have you spoken to them? <laughs> Good to see you too, Ed. I have not spoken to any of those three, uh, and I'd be curious to hear what they do think of AI as it pertains to uh, affecting the investment markets. And the reality is this, though. When we think about what does the future look like? I mean, we're the first firm, we think, to use LLMs to try to invest completely with no human intervention. Um, I think they would be interested to learn about how they do think like humans. And if you read the readings of a Buffett, if you read the readings of Stan Druckenmiller, a lot of what they talk about is really managing emotion. That's one of their secrets, and I think that's one of AI's superpowers.
I, I actually really want to drill into the mechanics of it. You know, I, I think about my own interaction with generative AI tools, and they can only recall what's within the database that they were trained on most of the time. It's like asking what the weather is um, to uh, GPT voice assistant. It's saying, well, I can't tell you what it is right now, only what it has been historically. How does that work in an investment case? Like, you know, how would uh, Warren Buffett have approached uh, one particular name? Just explain the, the, the system. Absolutely. There's two key pieces of information that we input into the models that we use. One piece of information is sort of an investment selection universe. So if we want to build a portfolio around large cap U.S. stocks, we'll have that data set and we'll include things like historical performance, we'll include forward estimates. And then in addition to that, we'll also include a philosophy that we sort of curate, again, going back to if we want an AI to think like Warren Buffett, we curate a philosophy around that based on his writings, based on things he's said. And when we combine those two pieces of information, which can be current information, that's how we end up getting our committee to act. There has been innovation going on at all of these large language model providers. And we think of O1 now happening with OpenAI and the idea that they're going to think. Mm -hmm. How will your own investment committee improve, adjust, change as innovations happen in the underlying large language models too? Yeah, Caroline, I think that's one of the most exciting parts of using AI as an investor. And I know Sam Altman has this quote, which is a little double-sided for us, which is the models you're using today are the dumbest models you ever have to use. Mm -hmm. So the disappointing thing is he's calling these models dumb. We don't think they're dumb because our testing shows that they're very effective as investors. But the upside to that is that these models only get smarter from here. We think about O1, advanced reasoning capabilities. I think as we see that kind of... Uh, permeate these other models that we use, like Claude, like Gemini, I think the committee continues to get smarter over time. Doug, very, very quick. Do you pay or license the, from the LLM providers? We do use their APIs, so we do pay for the usage of that technology. Intelligent Alpha CEO Doug Clinton, good to see you again. Thank you for coming back on the show. Some more news. And Ampere, the chip startup backed by Larry Ellison's Oracle, is exploring a potential sale. This according to sources who say the chip designer has been working with a financial advisor in recent months to help field takeover interests. And that Ampere is open to talking with a larger industry player about a possible transaction. Caro. Coming up. We're going to be speaking with Midi Health CEO Joanna Strober to discuss the company's oversubscribed Series B round and the future of women's health market. This is Bloomberg Technology. John Collison co-founded one of the most valuable private companies in the country, Stripe. Now, Collison and his team are expanding the company and its offerings while continuing to shrug off the question of an IPO. He spoke about that on the David Rubenstein Show. Listen to this. Some tech companies, maybe a lot of tech companies, go public a bit too early. And what I mean by that is, in Stripe's case, I mean, we still see tons of opportunity to change and um, uh, grow the business quite a lot. We're still constantly uh, inventing new products and uh, developing new business lines. And obviously, you can do that in the public markets. But I think culturally, we have ended up, uh, you know, you look at analysts following public companies and obsessing over guidance and what will be this quarter and things like that. Culturally, we've ended up, I think, in a bit more of a world where uh, public companies are suited for the extract stage of the uh, sigmoid curve rather than the uh, you know, expand stage. Stripe co-founder and President John Collison there. You can catch the full interview from the David Rubenstein show at Bloomberg.com. Let's talk elsewhere in venture because virtual care clinic Mini Health just finished its Series B funding round back in April. Over $60 million was raised and today its quick growth is luring some really high profile investors, including the likes of actor Amy Schumer, designer Tory Burch, not to mention a whole raft of tech names you will know and we've had on the show. Midi Health CEO Joanna Strober joins us now. It's a who's who in what is a special purpose vehicle that was set up. For what reason? Why did you want these women in particular, Joanna, to be signing up to, your, to back your company? 
So over 70 million women are in perimenopause and menopause, and it is a massively underserved market. And essentially, women don't get the care that they deserve to help them to thrive as they age after they have children. So what we really wanted to do was go out and target the smartest women in the country in business, entertainment, athletes, and get them to all help and join in our cause. And we really do view this as a mission. It is both a company that's expanding really rapidly, but also a mission to serve women. And so we wanted to have them to join us. You've got an investor group now, of course, women aged 35 to 60 plus, 40 percent people of color. You've got diversity there. Is this marketing? Are they going to go out and be your biggest backers? Are they going to preach the world of, of mini health? Or what other reason do you go to these particular people? Well, so part of it is marketing. They give us feedback. They're our patients. They give us feedback on what we're doing well and what we're not. They give us suggestions on AI and how we use AI to better scale our product. They're, we're getting marketing advice from really amazing celebrities who know how to build a brand. So really what we're doing is getting their expertise as well as their support while we're building the company. John, it's almost a year to the day since you, you actually announced your Series A. And at that time, the big focus for you guys was, was um, I guess, onboarding cl clinicians who had expertise in women's health. How much of that is now the focus in, in growing the business or have you moved on to the technology expansion? Yeah, so we have over 200 providers, probably 250 providers right now who are providing care. And now we are using technology to make sure that we scale their care appropriately. We, you, we use AI to make sure that they, we monitor them, to make sure that we give them the right feedback, we add new protocols. So we are using technology to scale the care, but essentially we are fundamentally a care company. Our job is to talk to people, to have those conversations and listen to women. So it is not just about technology. The technology is enabling us to scale, but we really focus on the care that we're providing, not, on, not solely on technology, but instead on making sure that our providers are able to best listen and take care of the women who come to us. Yeah, increasingly in our household, we, we have a digital relationship with our healthcare providers, you know, either through an app. Um, but the, the, always the issue is, is the insurance component, particularly in this country. How do you manage that? It, it can be a real frustration, particularly in the United States, when people just want digital care. Yeah, so we care deeply about democratizing access to great care, and the way we have to do that is through insurance coverage. So by the end of this year, we should have 70% of all women on PPO plans covered under our platform, and next year we will have Medicare. So we, we just care deeply that women have access to this care and insurance needs to pay for it. So that is how the entire company is structured. 63 million Series B, 5 million SPV, that's a lot of money. Where to allocate? Is it talent? Is it actually getting out there lobbying, informing people that you need to make these deals when it comes to insurance? Yeah, it's all those things. I mean, it costs us millions of dollars just to set up the platform to get the insurance companies on board, to set up their credentialing, and then to create our care protocols and be sure that we have doctors who are helping us to create new protocols. So as we look at the longevity space, if we look at the breast survivorship space, so we work on creating new care protocols as women come to us and have new needs, and, um, and then training our providers and making sure that they're all able to give expert care. So it is, uh, there's a lot that goes into scaling, and that's really where most of our money is going. Well, keep us up to speed with the journey. We appreciate you coming on, Joanna Strober of Midi Health. Meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. Once again, yeah. we go from public to private, and it's a big day for the markets. Yeah, massive day for the markets. You know, I think people still now ask the next question, what happens next? And it's hard to know in the context of a recession for tech or the rate path for tech. Uh, really, really tight, packed show. Recap on the podcast, you know exactly where to find it, on the terminal and online, on all the platforms you recognize, Apple, Spotify, and iHeart. From the team out in New York City, the team here in San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology.